I'm Ron right. Newman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the American Academy of Diplomacy, which was a co-sponsor of the project. The American Academy is a small organization comprised of most of America's now retired distinguished and senior diplomats, and its purpose is strengthening American diplomacy, and it works fairly hard at that. And so we were delighted to have the opportunity to work with USIP in sponsoring this project, which is certainly uh, right in the mainstream of issues of American diplomacy, particularly since there are a great many special envoys and a great many people who have strong opinions about that subject, and we thought it would be an interesting challenge to add fact to opinion. And so I congratulate Princeton Lyman, who was the, the progenitor of this project, and of course, it's very appropriate that Princeton is also a member of the Academy. So as, as many of you who work in Washington know, uh, there is a incestuous intertwining of personalities across the non-governmental organization of international affairs. And we represent that here. But this was a, this was a match that was, uh, if not made in heaven, certainly well made. I want to say uh, special thanks uh, to, uh, first of all, Amy Stoltz on my own staff who did a lot of backup and legwork, and particularly to Hannah Borsch of USIP, who uh, coaxed and prodded and got us all here among a great many other tasks, and we're very grateful to her. I'm, I'm not going to introduce the individuals because that would use up the entire time of the panel, um, but I will turn it over to Bob Beecroft and let them get started with serious this, uh, no, Tom. Yeah, I turned over to you first. Okay. To Tom Excellent. Periel. Uh, Tom, you're on, and I'm off. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Tom Periello. I'm a um, special representative at the State Department for the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. And both USIP and the American Academy of Diplomats have been invaluable partners uh, as we've been looking at a series of strategic questions uh, relating to the State Department and USAID. Um, and uh, this is certainly a topic that has come up from a few uh, angles, both the issue of proper use of, of special uh, envoys and representatives, and also the issue about overall operations in areas of conflict um, has certainly been a topic that's come up a great deal. Um, I'm going to hand it over with very brief bios to the authors, starting with Ambassador Lyman, um, former ambassador to many places, including Nigeria and Assistant Secretary for uh, African Affairs. Uh, and with that, I will let you tell us the, the findings and, and the wisdom. Well, thank, <coughs> thanks very much, Tom. I'm Princeton Lyman. I'm a, a senior advisor here at USIP, uh, Assistant Secretary of I.O. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, I want to talk about the origin of the study a little bit and the methodology, and then we'll get into the substance. But as uh, both Ron and Tom have mentioned, uh, the use of special envoys, it, particularly in co conflict situations, is a fact of life. It is something that administrations have used in the past. They will use it in the future. And while there is some controversy over the, the amount uh, uh, of effort uh, the uh, use or overuse of special envoys. The fact is they're an important instrument of U.S. foreign policy. And what we wanted to get at this study together, our two institutions, was how to make that more effective. What are the issues that arise? How do you make the use of envoys more effective? I came off of two years as the U.S. special envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, so I had some thoughts on this. But in our doing this study, what we did together, Bob and I, uh, was to first develop a set of issues that we thought were the relevant issues. We then convened two roundtables of diplomats, the former envoys, some military officers, et cetera, to review those terms of reference, if you will, and make sure that we were targeting the right issues. And then following that and revising it, we then uh, set out to interview uh, more than 20 people, former envoys, uh, people who had worked or selected envoys, uh, and others. And then we reviewed a lot of the memoirs of envoys who had worked on conflict situations. Now, I want to mention that we focused on special envoys in 
conflict situations. There are a lot of other special envoys, some for Islamic outreach, for climate change, etc. Some of our recommendations may be relevant to those, but we focus on conflict ones because there are some special characteristics. They're dealing with life and death situations, and they usually attract a very high level of both political and public attention. <clears throat> the, um, we, uh, after we, we, our interviews and our review of memoirs of several of the envoys covered a lot of conflict areas from Northern Ireland, Ireland, the Middle East, the Balkans, South Asia, uh, and several uh, situations in Africa. So we tried to reach out and get a perspective from people dealing with these issues over more than one administration and in various parts of the world. So let me turn to Bob, who will talk about the, the basic elements of the study. Thank you, Princeton. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, the, U the U.S. Institute of Peace and Princeton. Uh, the opportunity to work with him has been uh, really great, and I do appreciate it. Um, just touching briefly on the structure of the report and what we tried to cover, and I served as special envoy to the Bosnian Federation at the end of the Bosnian War, just a little under 20 years ago now. Uh, I later went back to Bosnia as ambassador and head of the OSCE mission. We began by looking at purpose, empowerment, and policy authority. What this means in brief terms is, what's the mandate? Um, is it broad or narrow? Is it clear or vague? Are the goals evident? Um, and we looked at a number of cases. Uh, we then looked at empowerment. What's the uh, authority uh, that the special envoy has or wishes that he or she had? Um, what is the relationship to foreign governments? Um, and what are the relationships with the US government? Um, after empowerment, we turn to policy authority. What is the uh, role in policy formulation that the special envoy has or does not have? Um, what are his or her channels into the decision-making process? Um, the next issue we looked at was dealing with what we called unfavorables. Sometimes uh, it's the special envoy's responsibility to deal with people that the U.S. government ordinarily would not touch with a 10-foot pole. But when you're in a, uh, an immediate post-conflict situation, these are the people who uh, are still relevant. And uh, the question is how you define the relationship with these people and how much you tell Washington about what you're doing. Um, I dealt with some later indicted war criminals in Bosnia, but um, it was necessary uh, to get past the, the conflict. Um, we go into that at some length. Then there's the issue of structure and turf battles. Exactly what kind of team can the special envoy put together, if any? Um, where is the special envoy going to be working from? We say in the report that in almost every case, special envoys are physically located at the State Department. I was phys physically located in a broom closet in Sarajevo, <laughs> but I did have a window. Um, and I got to know everybody at the embassy because uh, my broom closet was the only access to the bathroom. Um, so either you have a staff. In, in my case, uh, I served both as special envoy and as chargé d'affaires. So uh, there was some gray area between what the embassy staff did for me and what um, the embassy staff did for the special envoy. We played that game, I think, pretty well. So turf battles. Uh, there are turf battles taking place in Washington. There are turf battles between authorities in Washington and in the field, and there are turf battles locally. All of this um, required a certain amount of uh, creativity and uh, fast footwork at times. Um, and then there's the question of state NSC rivalry, which is another kind of turf battle, which we can talk about later. Finally, outreach. Whom do we reach out to? There's Congress, there are advocacy groups, and there is civil society, when there is civil society, in the conflict areas. The concept of civil society basically doesn't play very well, or didn't, uh, 
20 years ago in the former Yugoslavia. Um, but we had to work with all of these people and in some cases create at least the, the bases of a civil society which would then, uh, we hope, take root on its own. So those were the areas that the report covered and as Princeton said, um, we had the opportunity to talk to current and former special envoys um, and learn from them about how they did their jobs and compare it against our own experiences. I thought, Tom, if, <coughs> if you agree, what uh, Bob and I might just share some of our experiences and then to ask uh, Dan and, and David to do the same. Excellent. Well, let me start with this questions of empowerment and mandate and authority. Uh, if you're a presidential envoy, what everybody wants to know is, are you really the president's envoy? That is, uh, are you being uh, speaking for the president? Do you have the president's backing? Uh, are, are, does the president look to you as the key person in that regard? And that comes from, from both the substantive relationship, but also <coughs> comes from appearances. Uh, one of the first things I did when I, even before becoming the full envoy, but the assistant envoy is when President Obama went up to New York at the General Assembly. It was important. I was sitting right behind him. Uh, the, vis the, the, the visible characteristics are important. We know cases where envoys are appointed and not empowered. They're forgotten. They don't, they don't show up. But then the question of authority and mandate. Because authority comes, yes, in part from empowerment, but it comes from much more. If you're going to have authority as the leader in the policy situation, you have to have credibility. You have to show respect for all the other actors in that situation, the bureaucratic <coughs> actors, the substantive actors. And then you have to come up with <coughs> credible policy recommendations. In Sudan's case, we had two policies running at the same time. On the one hand, the president and several senior people in the Sudan government were indicted war criminals. I wasn't even allowed to talk to the president or those so indicted. On the other hand, my mandate, as the president repeated every time he introduced me, this is Princeton Lyman. He's working to prevent Sudan and South Sudan from going back to war. And to do that, we had to get Sudan's cooperation to allow for the independence of South Sudan. Walking those two lines of policy meant we had a lot of differences over shading, et cetera. And it was important to respect the interests of the war crimes office in the department, the DR, the democracy people, the human rights people, and at the same time, give me enough leeway to be credible with the Sudanese government that what we were looking for was going to be in the long-term interests of that country as well as of South Sudan. So how you get authority, use authority, and create authority uh, has a lot to do with how you act in those situations, but also starting with the empowerment you get from the president, or in some cases from the secretary of state. And that contrasts interestingly with the situation that I encountered in Sarajevo when I arrived there in the summer of 1996. Um, the war had just ended. Um, there was still some, some shooting going on. Uh, the U.S. military had come in heavy. We had 50,000 American troops in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a country about the size of West Virginia, with a population of 4 million, uh, also 1 million refugees and 200,000 casualties. Um, we also had a holy writ. It's called the Dayton Accords. The Dayton Accords, which were uh, the product of the will of one single person, the very special envoy, Dick Holbrook, uh, had in effect defined the outlines of a government which did not exist. Um, in fact, uh, the Dayton Accords were signed in two cases out of three by non-Bosnians. They were signed by Slobodan Milosevic in Belgrade and Franjo Tudjman in Zagreb. Um, the only Bosnian to sign them was the Muslim Bosniak leader Ali uh, Izetbegovic. So um, basically what we had done was given ourselves cover because the neighbor the neighbors signed it but we didn't want to deal with the local war criminals uh, at least as a government. I however was in a position where I dealt with uh, indictables as we called them all the time 
and a number of them were later indicted and ended up in The Hague, uh, which in most cases was a richly deserved location for them. But in other words, we had a structure, we, the United States, we, the so-called Peace Implementation Council, which was the U.S. plus Canada plus the European Union plus Russia and Turkey representing the organization of the Islamic Conference, to put together a country which did not exist. And um, so we didn't have to worry much about purpose. The purpose was to, well, we in this country tend to call it nation building. I prefer to call it state building, to build a viable state. Uh, as for empowerment, the State Department led the process, working hand in hand with the US military. I worked very closely with a then two-star general named David Petraeus, who was the first one in. Um, to enforce the peace and prevent a reigniting of the conflict. Um, as for policy authority, it was all here. We had the authority. Um, Dick Holbrook called the shots from Washington and once a month would come out to Sarajevo and scare everybody. But we worked together very well and I was his man on the ground and uh, spent my time shuttling between mainly the Croats and the Bosniaks, that is to say between the Catholics and the Muslims, and then when I became chargé as well, added the Serbs to the list of people to shuttle to. It was a, a jawboning exercise because there was no resistance. We called all the shots. Very different. Let me talk a little bit more about this question of dealing with what we call unfavorables. It's a, one of the chapters in the report that I think is one of the most important. There are, there are risks in dealing with people who are either indicted or war criminals or in some cases terrorists. And, and it, it is important to weigh those risks and have an understanding of whether it's worthwhile or not to engage. So it's not, it's not necessarily the thing to do in every case. I was not allowed to speak to the president of Sudan. It, it clearly limited to a large extent our role in, in the situation. I reserved the right to ask for that policy to be re reviewed if I felt it essential. I never reached that point because there were risks in opening that door. But I think it had to be an issue on the table. There were others out there who were also indicted that I found it necessary to be engaged with. And that comes to another question. If you're going to be a special envoy, you have to take some risks. If you feel you have the right authority and you feel this is necessary, you have to take some risks doing things that may not have uh, received all the blessings in the world. If you take those risks, you ought to be ready to take the blow back if they go sour. Mm -hmm. But I think some risk and giving the uh, special envoy some latitude in that regard is uh, one of the uses you can make of a special envoy because that person is not in the line of normal diplomatic representation and activity and therefore it doesn't convey the same necessarily recognition of the interlocutor in with whom you're in engaging. Let me go on to, uh, to this question of relationships within the bureaucracy, because this comes up all the time. And one of the most sensitive areas with a special envoy, especially a presidential one, but even sometimes a secretarial special envoy, is the relationship to the Department of State, to those mechanisms that are there all the time dealing with that conflict and our diplomacy, and particularly the regional assistant secretary and the regional bureau. There's no cookie cutter way to resolve those issues. It depends a lot on the structure of the, of the situation, et cetera. What we found in all our interviews was chemistry matters. And chemistry means that you respect each other. You respect the important roles that embassies play. And there's, it's as we in indicate in the report where people, envoys did not involve the embassies and paid a price for it. Uh, respecting the role of the department and in my case, I was recruited by the Assistant Secretary uh, Africa saying, I know this guy, he won't give me too much trouble. And we worked very, very closely. The other thing that we were able to do at the request of the department was actually to help in the state White House rivalry over who controlled Sudan mm -hmm. policy. And after we 
made it clear, I made it clear that I wasn't going to engage in that very much in one side or the other. The State Department said, well, then would you co coordinate our representation at the NSC on these issues, which I did, and that facilitated the State Department's uh, role with the NSC, and I worked very closely, of course, with the Assistant Secretary. It's important that that relationship be understood, that it has inherent rivalries, but they can be overcome if people really make an effort to do so. Again, an interesting contrast. Uh, in the case of Bosnia, there was little uh, NSC or White House direct engagement. Um, I think it's fair to say that President Clinton had uh, hesitated to engage in the Balkan Wars until the um, events of the summer of 1995, uh, Srebrenica, and uh, the bombing of the market in Sarajevo. In that, at that point, it became the first television war, and uh, we saw a whole lot of Christian Amanpour all the time. Um, the consequence was that there was pressure to, quote, do something, unquote. And that's when Dick Holbrook got the, um, uh, the players together in, in, uh, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. So the objectives were basically defined by Holbrook and his people. He was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. Um, and execution was left to him based in Washington mostly in general terms, and to me on the ground for the specific, specific execution of what, uh, of what we had envisaged. Um, this changed when John Kornblum succeeded Dick Holbrook in 1996. Dick stayed on for a while as special envoy, but John Kornblum was the assistant secretary. Um, Holbrook came out once in a while every couple of months in a C-20. My job was to create what was called the Federation Forum, which was a group of Croats and Bosniaks, so Catholics and Muslims, because these things are always seen in confessional terms in the Balkans, um, who had been fighting each other. Having started out as allies, they ended up fighting each other. And this was to get that half of Bosnia working again. And the Federation Forum met virtually every week. Um, and. My staff, as I said, consisted mainly of me and embassy officers. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Let me just deal with one more and then we'll go beyond. And that's the question of the structure of the uh, envoy's office within the State Department. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, he had very few staff. We looked at various envoy situations. Some had staff from the regional bureau, some had little. There are three instances we deal with in the report of, of significantly <coughs> autonomous offices under the special envoy. Uh, currently the special uh, representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the office that I directed, the U.S. office on <coughs> Sudan and South Sudan. In, the, in my case, the desk officers were under my office, as well as a cadre of regional specialists and others contracted by the Con Conflict and Stabilization Bureau. I had tens of millions of dollars of resources to dispense. I had a lot of control over the machinery of policy and, and support, which was very helpful. But there's a danger in that degree of autonomy. You can get separated too much from the rest of the structure, as I mentioned, the importance of the embassy's role. In my case, I found that strong embassies were critical, but in some cases, those offices don't pay enough attention. And second, resources are helpful. They were helpful in my case, but I found we also strayed into areas that were better done by USAID and that we uh, sometimes didn't lack the oversight for running projects in the field from Washington. So I think there are pluses to that kind of an office, but there are warnings uh, as well. Yeah. So Dan, why don't we uh, shift to you and get some reaction to the report and a little bit of your own experience of uh, how, how we might be thinking about this. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a very important report, and I want to commend uh, USIP, Princeton, and Bob for uh, giving us something to work with uh, that's now organized and very well structured. It raises uh, the issues that need to be thought about and in a sense can provide a guide path for an administration thinking about uh, deploying an envoy. Uh, 
What it also needs to uh, do, however, is uh, to stimulate case studies, because what we've had today even are two examples of successful envoys, uh, but they're successful in part, I would think, because uh, both of these gentlemen uh, came up through the system. Uh, they were both experts uh, before being appointed uh, envoys. They were experts in the uh, areas and the fields that they were asked to uh, focus on. Uh, they had experience uh, in the field, uh, and they knew how Washington and the Department of State and the interagency system worked. Uh, that has not always been the case in all of the uh, conflict situations where envo envoys have been appointed, as suggested in the report itself. And so therefore, um, a series of case studies uh, on the way uh, envoys worked in different situations could be quite helpful. Uh, as some of you know, I spent most of my career in uh, the Middle East, particularly focused in the uh, Arab-Israeli uh, conflict area, uh, ambassador to Egypt, ambassador to Israel. Uh, and I saw uh, 15, count them, 15 envoys over the course of about 30 years. And if you g review the names of those envoys, you're talking about what we would call an all-star list. Uh, Roy Atherton, Bob Strauss, Saul Linowitz, Don Rumsfeld, uh, uh, Jim Leonard, Watt Clavarius, Maury Draper, uh, Richard Fairbanks, Dick Murphy, Dennis Ross, Tony Zinni, uh, John Wolfe, uh, George Mitchell, Martin Indyk, and now Frank Lowenstein. Now, you would expect uh, with this kind of a lineup, if we're using our baseball analogy, that uh, the scoreboard would look pretty good. But the scoreboard actually shows no hits, no runs, and lots of errors. <laughs> Um, which suggests that this is one of the case studies which needs to be undertaken uh, to find out whether or not it's the idea of an envoy in this situation or the individual selected as the envoy, the conflict itself, or the criteria that the report has suggested. Was it an absence of empowerment by a president? Was it an absence of authority? Uh, were there turf battles in Washington? And I think you'd find if uh, we did this case study, and we haven't done it yet, but uh, it's certainly this report should stimulate it, and I may grab the opportunity and do it myself. Um, I think you'd find that uh, there are a combination of factors at play here that suggest that even some of the smartest and most senior people selected for this job um, were not necessarily the right uh, choice uh, and not necessarily the right choice for this conflict. After all, if you look back at the last 35, a little more than 35 years in the Arab-Israeli conflict resolution process, there have been three American successes, but they have all been shepherded by secretaries of state and by presidents. They have not been shepherded by envoys. Now, part of this may be a problem that we have created ourselves. We have raised the level of engagement in this conflict to a point where the parties simply don't pay much attention to an envoy below the level of Secretary of State, and sometimes not even to a Secretary of State, waiting for the president. Uh, and that may be a, a major factor at play in the Arab-Israeli conflict. But it also suggests that uh, context, uh, speci uh, uh, specificity, um, and I would add, and I want to say this carefully because we're talking about smart envoys, um, understanding of nuance and details. Not all of our envoys entered the job knowing what the Arab-Israeli conflict is all about, and many of them left the job not knowing what the Arab-Israeli conflict was all about. Uh, and what that does is not only represent a waste of an American asset, which is the power to do diplomacy, but it also uh, weakens our ability to then pick up the conflict resolution process once that envoy has left uh, the job. I had an experience when I was serving as ambassador in Israel. We had an envoy who was appointed to uh, monitor uh, the compliance of the parties with the roadmap. I, I can mention his name, John Wolf. He is a senior State Department official who was asked to uh, drop his job in political military affairs and come out for a few months. Uh, and John was a strong diplomat but had no background at all in the Arab-Israeli conflict and no background at all in trying to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. And it was a series of um, errors and problems over the course of three months, some of which uh, 
uh, actually impeded the efforts of Israelis and Palestinians to reach small agreements on what we called then the roadmap that uh, President George W. Bush had unveiled uh, a short time before. Uh, now, during that period, I came back to Washington for a couple of days, went in to see uh, the then Deputy Secretary of State, Rich Armitage, and I said, Rich, I like John Wolfe. Why did you appoint somebody who d didn't know anything at all about this conflict for this job? And, and for those of you who know Rich Armitage, he said, that was exactly why I did it. He wanted somebody who would be tabula rasa. Mm. Now, in some situations, maybe tabula rasa works. It doesn't work when you're dealing with two entrenched parties in a protracted conflict They've been at this thing for decades. They know each other far better than they know us, and they deal with each other far better than we assume they deal with each other. And in walks somebody, a babe in the woods, and doesn't really help uh, resolve issues. Uh, I could go on. We've had other situations uh, re referenced in this report. For example, was the fact that when Dennis Ross was appointed the Special Middle East Coordinator, one of the things that he demanded was that that office be taken out of the normal bureaucracy of the State Department. And in fact, uh, in 1992, 93, 93 actually when uh, that office was created, I was serving as a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Near East Bureau. And the day of the announcement, I went in to see Ed Jeregian, who was our Assistant Secretary, and I said, Ed, I'm sorry, you're leaving your post. And Ed said to me, why, I'm not leaving my post. I said, wait, they've just taken one of the, the heartbeats, one of the jewels of your portfolio away from you. Why would you remain as the assistant secretary when you no longer have responsibility for one of the most critical issues in the portfolio? Um, and it suggests to you that there, this uh, bifurcation of responsibilities uh, was a problem from the outset. And it became a more pronounced problem over time because what NEA had to offer was the expertise and experience of a lot of very good officers who had served in the field, uh, but who now became um, separated from uh, the uh, conflict resolution process. Uh, and it, it, it uh, I think, uh, ended up uh, hurting that process uh, over time. Uh, on the issue of latitude uh, to deal with unfavorables, we're still living with this problem. Uh, we had envoys who, for many years, could not deal with uh, the uh, uh, representative of the Palestinian people, the Palestine Liberation Organization, because of American policy. In fact, the United States government, for many of these years, was talking to the PLO, but through the CIA, not through the State Department. So we had a channel with an organization that was an unfavorable but it was a channel that was not helping us at all deal with the conflict resolution process. We have the same issue today with Hamas, where if you're going to appoint an envoy to deal with the Arab-Israeli issue, uh, for example, uh, as Martin Indyk was appointed or now Frank Lowenstein is uh, acting, um, does it make sense for that envoy not to be able to talk to all Palestinians? It doesn't mean we like them. It doesn't mean we support those who are engaged in terrorism, which Hamas is engaged in terrorism. But if the envoy doesn't have the mandate or the uh, scope of responsibility to reach out to all elements within the two societies in which he or she is working, uh, how effective is that going to be in trying to produce an agreement that can be um, uh, agreed and, and implemented? So there are a, a number of issues uh, taking the Arab-Israeli case as a case study, which suggests that using the uh, five categories or five criteria that uh, this very useful report has uh, given us uh, could be very important in understanding uh, whether or not uh, th this thing works, whether the envoy process works in particular conflict situations. I would add as a closing sentence uh, my own bias, which is that in the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, presidents and secretaries of state uh, will be fooling themselves to believe that they can outsource this conflict resolution process to an envoy. That doesn't mean that the secretary has to run out to the region every week or two, may want to uh, comprise a team of uh, his own uh, experts to pursue this.
Uh, but we've created a situation in which Arabs and Israelis are uh, waiting to see that the President and the Secretary of State are engaged in that process, and an envoy is simply not going to substitute for the presidential power and the Secretary's prestige. Thank you. Thank you so, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, David, we'll go to you. You've seen this from the inside. You've seen this from the advocacy community. Uh, you know some of the Hill dynamics on it as well. Talk a little bit about um, what lessons you feel like uh, we've learned over the last however many years in looking at this and um, any reactions to the report as well. Thanks so much, and thanks so much to USIP for inviting me to participate in this, ma this panel, and thanks to the authors for laying out some very interesting ideas. And I, I actually came away from the report feeling somewhat like Dan did, that there was a lot of very interesting nuggets and descriptions of case studies, but to really understand some of these issues, you really have to go more in depth. And I think that one issue that really needs to be on the table is why do we have special representatives and special envoys. The report does talk about that to some degree, but if you go back and look at diplomatic history, we've always had special envoys and special representatives. If you go back to 1789, George Washington had a personal representative who, to, who went to the court of St. James to represent the United States with what had to be the most important relationship that the U.S. had at the time, and Congress didn't even know about it until a year and a half later. Um, similarly, you could go to Woodrow Wilson, who had a bad relationship with his Secretary of State and who sent Colonel Edward House to try to negotiate peace in Europe in 1915. Um, this was a central issue to try to keep the U.S. out of the war, and the President sent a, 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 a basically a private figure, someone who was working for the White House, but who did not have relationships with the State Department in any significant way. Of course, Harry Hopkins is an example that you know, we, we, I won't spend time talking about. I think that the report does raise a number of issues. And Dan, I think that while I accept what you say about trying to dig deeply into the Arab-Israeli conflict, but I think that the Arab-Israeli conflict in some ways is unique in this kind of context because of the very deep domestic political dynamics that are involved, the uh, great deal of uh, energy that has been invested by the United States and uh, over the time since the 70s, at least in particular. So I think that it, it, it's, it, it's an important one to look at, but perhaps not the best one to measure these criteria against. So for example, one of the uh, areas that I was, have been involved with was the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and the appointment of Senator Feingold as, an, as a, uh, a special envoy there. Um, if you look at what was happening before that, the, our, our uh, policy with respect to the DRC was somewhat in disarray. We had um, very conflicting views within the administration regarding what was the role of Rwanda, how do we pr approach President Kagame, uh, what was the, uh, the right view and approach. Um, and you had some significant dysfunction. And in that context, as pressure was building from the advocacy community and the congressional uh, uh, members of Congress who were interested in this issue to appoint a special advisor, um, it, as was reflected, uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson, who was Assistant Secretary at the time, appointed a very skilled diplomat, but someone who was not very well known in the region, he had served there, didn't have a huge amount of stature and was considered a special advisor and was frankly not the kind of dynamic individual that was needed. Uh, so there was a big push to have a, a more significant individual brought in line, and in fact people were very surprised when Senator Feingold agreed to take on that position. And I think that uh, someone like Senator Feingold in that position can do things that are important. So if you look at the Africa Affairs Bureau and their scope of jurisdiction, there are some huge problems that the Assistant Secretary has to deal with. They've got Nigeria, which could collapse the entire continent if it, if it, if it, if it goes down. It's got Zimbabwe, which is uh, a huge human rights problem we've historically spent a lot of time on. Kenya was on the, the, the cusp of violence and then came on the cusp of violence again. And of course, you have Sudan, South Sudan, and look what happened to the Central African Republic just last year. So in the context where an Assistant Secretary Secretary has multiple crises that have significant political attention. Bringing in a special envoy can sometimes, I think, be a constructive approach to trying to deal with it. In the case of DRC, though, I think something that the report indicated happened that was very important, which was when uh, Senator Feingold came in, he had a policy structure 
to go forward with, similar to what Bob Beercroft was saying. You had the peace and security cooperation framework that re basically was the roadmap. Was it a detailed roadmap? No. Implementation of that roadmap was going to be critical in order for it to su succeed, and therefore some, having someone who could go in with a stature, indicate that he had a personal relationship with the president, and to Dan's point, had been studying these issues for a long time, as a longtime member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, did understand the building, at least to some degree, and was able to fit in within the bureaucracy in a way which I think most people see as fairly constructive. So I think that that contrast between the before and the after in a context where there are multiple different pieces is important to think about. Um, on the other hand, we've seen envoys who have had mandates constructed for them in part because of advocacy from the advocacy community that were real failures. So it's interesting to look at the list of envoys that are on the American Foreign Service Association's list of 25 envoys, and you know, we have two envoys for North Korea. We have an envoy that's supposed to negotiate on the issues around the North Korean nuclear section, but because Congress felt that there was not enough attention for human rights, you have a North Korean ambassador for human rights, special representative for human rights. So how does that work? Or in the case of Sudan, as I'm sure Princeton will remember, the, uh, in, in the context of the North-South negotiations, that was the real focus of the special envoy's view. There was very little attention being paid to Darfur, which was kind of an intractable situation in many ways at that time. Um, and so there was a big push to have a senior advisor or a special representative on Darfur. That was not a very successful or wise advocacy push in my mind in hindsight. There were reasons for it. I think that you could reasonable people could differ about whether it was a good idea when we were pushing for it. And at the end, there was a good result because the U.S., when pressing for implementation of the separate Darfur peace agreement, saw that that was never going anywhere, actually helped, I think, get to the United States to the point where it was looking at what the right solution was in, with respect to Sudan, which was a comprehensive approach to deal with all its conflicts. Nonetheless, I think that there was a significant waste of bureaucratic time and effort, and I really am not sure that, that it, it, was a, it was a positive thing. There is something strange about the whole special envoy field. So people come in and say, look, the State Department doesn't have enough focus on this issue. That's such a fragmented system. We need someone to bring you know, people together. And the White House and the DOD are fighting. So our answer is to create more fragmentation by creating a new office with a new person, with new staff, who may not actually be very um, significantly knowledgeable about, about the area. Um, Latitude. So latitude is very interesting, and I was interested to hear the emphasis that our presenters put on it today. Um, I think that there's a challenge or there's an internal <coughs> tension in the paper about this. So if you believe that the only way to have an effective envoy is to have someone who's really empowered, who's someone seen as important, who's sitting behind the president at the meetings, and who has the poly policy authority, then how is it that they're really outside of the chain of command or outside of the political challenges that can be faced if they meet with the unfavorables? And I think that this points to um, you know, a challenge that I think goes very much, I agree with Princeton in his analysis that there's a risk reward issue here. So we had a big debate between the two of us about the visit of one of uh, President Bashir's advisors uh, this is the advisor, um, Nafi, who was an advisor to the president, who had been involved in, or we believe, most people believe, was involved in the Darfur genocide. Um, Princeton had met him in, uh, in Khartoum. Uh, and most of us, uh, I don't know if I can't speak for everyone in the advocacy community because it's a very fragmented community, but most of us had no problem with him meeting with, uh, with, with Nafi. But when there was a suggestion that they would, uh, the administration would invite Nafi to the United States, people got very much in arms, and in fact, the founder of my organization called me in an irate fashion. And I think that the, the, the question in, in meeting with unfavorables is what's the risk or the reward? What, and our questions were, what's the strategy here? Okay, if you're gonna bring an unfavorable here to the United States, what are we getting for it? Are you gonna be able to actually do something constructive and productive with them? Because it is gonna confer legitimacy on that individual. It is going to be a, be a propaganda coup for a regime that the whole strategy is around isolation. So I think that this, uh, these are, this is a tough issue, and I think that the, it's one of the reasons why 
I think there has to be some significant conversations around what are the right kind of individuals for these kinds of positions who are willing to take these risks. Because it, it, is, it, is it the case that it's only the foreign policy professionals who have been in the field and so on who are able to do these jobs because of all the things that Dan Dan said. You need um, people who have an inside knowledge of the department. You need people who have had negotiating experience. You need to have people who have had field or international experience. You need people who are willing to collaborate. You, have, you need people who have had multinational experience. I think one of the things that Princeton benefited from was his time as Assistant Secretary for International Organizations because in the context of the, uh, of the very complicated way Sudan was being dealt with, the UN system had a very important role, peacekeeping missions in both countries, a very uh, uh, capable uh, special representative in Haley Mancarios. And so the, 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 that experience, which is often very common, not in the Arab-Israeli context, because there the, the notion was let's keep the UN out because of various political dynamics. But in most of these conflict situations, the UN is really critical do uh, a lot of foreign um, first service uh, experts, career ambassadors or retired ambassadors have that kind of experience. But on the same time, individuals who are outside the system, as we say, also lack some of those key experiences that I mentioned, the front part. So I think it really goes to how do we select in individuals. Um, I, I don't know, I, maybe I'll, I'll just make a couple of brief comments um, is, uh, with respect to turf battles, I really think there's no right answer on structure and so on. It really is very personal. I think the chemistry matters issue is very big. I think there is something very interesting about where there are complex <coughs> dynamics between the White House and the State Department over an issue because of its political volatility, because of its importance domestically and so on. It is a real question about whether it's an addition or a subtraction to have a special ambassador. I mean, I was in meetings in, uh, uh, during the peace process when Dan was Deputy Assistant Secretary. Uh, by the way, if you see smoke coming out of, my, out of my ears, because I'm not sure whether to talk about my experience in state or in the Hill or on, uh, in, in the advocacy community, but uh, there were some very frosty meetings. And they weren't just frosty because the State Department chafed that Dennis Ross had responsibilities in this area. It was also because those at the NSC who had responsibility in those areas were chafing under the, uh, the, the, that, that, the kind of structure that Dennis was able to build for himself. And sometimes it could work out because you had three sort of power centers and you could kind of negotiate through. Sometimes it didn't. So I think that, those, that, that there's a lot of personality issues that really need to be uh, thought through and uh, the kind of tethering that has been talked about. And we can perhaps talk more, uh, more about that. I think the outreach issue is significant. I think it's another piece of if you're going to have a very spe uh, effective special envoy, it, particularly in an area that's politically volatile or there's a lot of political interest or a huge amount of civic interest, being able to negotiate the halls of Congress is really critical. Um, being able to talk to the uh, members of Congress on, in both the House and the Senate, as well as civil society. That's a skill set that not everyone has. Uh, that, uh, you know, I think that Scott Gratian, who was a special envoy when I first started working, he had his challenges on both those scores, um, and that really undermined his role in, in being able to be effective. Um, and so the, having the right skills in that area can, can be really, really critical. Um, let me just leave it at that and see whether you have any questions, Tom, to kick us off or you want to go to the audience. I do, but I, I have some questions, but I really want to open it up um, uh, and give folks a chance because uh, before, before we end. Um, and I, I want to come back to, again, this issue of turf. There, there's a certain sense, I'll just ask one question and then, and then hand it over. Is it too simplistic to say that part of the message here is when it comes to envoys, go big or go home, that this, this tension of saying, if it's just another seat at the table, I mean, there, there seems to be an inherent tension here, which is it's a building. Mm. These are buildings that really believe in working things up through the building, working through a clearance process, et cetera, sort of consensus or what sometimes seems like faux consensus uh, building up through. And that to be effective, as you've noted, you've got to be able to sit down with the head of state or foreign minister and right. people know that you're in charge. Um, and so is this one of these things where if you're not willing to give it that authority, you may end up just with the, uh, another, an, another cook in the kitchen? Well, if, you, if you're going to appoint an envoy and you don't give them authority, you shouldn't bother. Right. I mean, I, I don't know what the point would be uh, to do that. 
And we have cases, and we allude to them in the report, where uh, that's happened, uh, where the authority or the empowerment has been undercut uh, by the secretary or the president or, or otherwise. I think in dealing with this question of, of turfs and structures, it depends a lot on the nature of the conflict you're dealing with. In the Sudan case, the, the, the issues on the ground bilaterally were as uh, integral to the uh, peace process. In other cases, that isn't necessarily the, the case. So in the Sudan case, I found it very valuable that the desk structures and the outreach to the ambassadors was coming through from my office. But there may be other cases where that is not quite the case and that the bureau support to the envoy is sufficient. So I think one has to look at that in terms of what is the nature of the conflict and the mandate. Yeah, I would go along with that. I mean, my experience was that uh, the European Bureau played a very big role in the post-conflict situation in Bosnia, for example, and that was fine. Secretary of State was comfortable with it. The President and the NSC were very comfortable with it, and uh, as I said before, we had a clear roadmap on what we were supposed to be doing there, and it was a situation in which the United States largely called the shots. So in that situation, it was more executing a policy, but doing it on the ground and understanding the issues, um, and in effect building a country which um, didn't exist in 1996. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my question has to do with uh, <coughs> So I'll make it very quick. Question has to do with Cuba and Iran. Do you think uh, in those two cases, especially on that might work? Well, uh, I I would get, I don't I don't pretend to be an expert in those two areas, uh, but I would have thought on the question of Iran, where you already have a major negotiation underway on the nuclear, that to have a separate envoy on the overall relationship probably gets in the way. But beyond that, or leading up to that, perhaps a, a special envoy might have been useful. Uh, a special envoy in Cuba might have been useful beforehand, but now that we are in the process of establishing a regular di structure in diplomatic relations, I'm not sure that that would be necessary. Well, uh, I, oh. I, I would just underscore uh, what Princeton said. You're talking two different types of issues. The, the Cuba issue, it seems to me, is a Nixon-China question. It's reversing a many decades long policy. And so in a sense, uh, there had to be not only complete coherence in how you're going to run it, but the policy issues really did do need to be run out of the White House until the point where the president has now announced the change where it can enter into a more normal uh, building of a diplomatic infrastructure. Uh, with Iran, uh, and we're still in the middle of that, uh, you've had so far an interesting case study of uh, the utility of multiple tracks that are very well integrated at the source. You had the professional negotiations through the P5 plus one, that were proceeding along a certain track, and you had a, a secret channel also run out of the State Department by the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Bill Burns, with White House uh, involvement, and the two were, were connected at the hip. So if we did our case studies, this might prove to be one of the most um, efficient uses of a variety of envoy types, but it would also, I think, prove the idea that you need people with the experience, the expertise, and familiarity within the system to be able to maintain that integrity of the effort. And just let me uh, put a punctuation point on, on that particular comment because I think it's something that we haven't talked about. There was a special envoy for Cuba. It just was an unnamed National Security Council official until we found out about it. I mean, that's what, that's what happened, is that they ran it out of the National Security Council. Right. There was obviously some coordination with the State Department and Secretary Kerry was involved, but in terms of some of the key meetings, 
um, that were uh, were at uh, sort of the operating level. It was really the NSC that that, that did it. I think that the um, you know, the Iran example. I, I agree with Dan. There was a special envoy for Iran. His name was Bill Burns. He was within the system. He was not named. He had you know all the authority. He had the undersecretary uh, for. Uh, for political affairs also backing him up. We had a huge amount of senior attention there. And I think that it was an effective model that, that you have to look at. I just don't think that every situation in which the U.S. can make a real difference can have that kind of involvement from senior officials. But I think that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important case. And you see this in other cases. I think that one of the, uh, the, the warnings that is in the paper is about just don't do something because Congress says you should do it, that you, know, you really need to look at how you do it. But I think there is a way of dealing with those issues through the double hatting concept that is mentioned in the paper. So for example, in our China relations, of course, Tibet always gets short tripped. That is the nature of the US relationship with China. There are, isn't that there aren't people who think it's important. There aren't people who are working on it within the US government, but it always gets short tripped. So the US, the, uh, US Congress said there has to be a special coordinator on Tibet. What did the Bush administration do when that happened? They appointed Tala, Paula Dobriansky, the Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, as the special coordinator for Tibet. And I think that did help both politically for the administration as well as internally to say, yes, we need to think more about these issues and how we deal with those issues. So I think that kind of fusion approach is something that is useful to consider. There has to be a decision taken at the outset. Is the special envoy, especially when it's a publicly known envoy, there for symbolic purposes or to actually do stuff? Would you concede that there can be some value in the symbolic? Depends on the situation. Yeah, but it's also, it's also, uh, it's also somewhat deceptive to your international interlocutors. Yeah. You're pretending to have a stake in it and you're going to deliver something and you really don't have the, the, right. the support behind it to do so. You know, it highlights an issue, but you know, I've known people in that situation, and I, I, I describe it like uh, as uh, walking naked into the jungle. I mean, you're out there with nothing behind you, and uh, I don't recommend it. You know, Princeton, there is a reality show about that, yeah. so. <laughs> I and Tom, Tom I, a little bit of diplomatic experience in the back. Uh, oh, yes. to ask Tom, if I could just add oh, one sure, thing sure. To, to Princeton. I, <clears throat> and when the 2006 Lebanon-Israel war broke out, I was asked to go on CNN in one of those cases where they had four little boxes, you know, four talking heads, three from Congress and me, and the three from Congress were all very upset that we had not appointed an envoy to solve the problem. And mm. when they got to me, I said, uh, I don't have a problem appointing an envoy. I first would like to see what our policy is. And it kind of struck everybody as strange that we would ask that question. But I think that gets the point Princeton made. What is the envoy being asked to do? And if it's symbolic, just to kind of wave the flag, then it's, uh, it actually hurts our interests in these conflicts. Well, I may address the Congress question, but we'll go with this question first. Yeah, thank you, Tom, very much. Tom Pickering from Hills and Company. I just had two brief points and question. Uh, one is, uh, I'm very supportive of the idea that Dan Kurtzer raised, that you've now opened the door. I think it's an excellent report, but it's very clear that there is a next level, if I could put it this way, of understanding and indeed uh, of detail. It would be enormously valuable as this process goes ahead, and particularly in the area of conflict resolution, and I would strongly second, and I think that the rest of you up there are probably tilted in that direction. The second question is the broader question. Uh, for a number of you have slid into the question of envoys who are not there to deal with conflicts, as we understand the word conflict. Um, and they raise a different sort of set of situations, some of which are very much parallel to what the report is considered, and some go beyond that. And some of them, I think, transgress a number of the lines that you have drawn that in some ways would be very useful. And so I raise the question, isn't it time now uh, for somebody, whether it's the Institute of Peace, the Academy of Diplomacy, the QDDR process, uh, a, a contracted people from outside, whatever we want to do, uh, obviously paying attention to the knowledge to do that. In many ways over the years, there was a process in the State Department uh, of being light on these kinds of people and often gathering them up to create a new bureau. 
And in some cases, the absorption of these people into the structure was the natural element of what had to be done. If people think the State Department wasn't paying attention uh, and wanted a special envoy, over a period of time, we probably needed a bureau with deep experience working in the subject rather than the, what I would call attention light factor uh, of the special envoy. There is also finally the question of how does the special envoy relationship, particularly in conflict resolution, accord with the rest of our policies? You've touched on some of that in the natural conflict, if I could put it this way, between the functional bureaus, particularly those that deal with democracy and human rights, and some of the more difficult questions that arise in conflict resolution. Um, but I'd be grateful to if you would address the two questions, the broadening question to other special kinds of appointments, and the other question of how and in what way do special envoys have to take care and attention uh, to look at the rest of U.S. foreign policy and how it fits into the context in which they work. Thank you. Well, I, I, I hope you will comment on it from your work on the QDDR in particular. And, and on, you know, we didn't try to take on the whole envoy question for, uh, for because the conflict ones had special characteristics. But Tom, you're putting your finger on a, on, a, on a problem because if you looked at the number of special envoys, and it's almost the same from one administration to another, you're talking about 25 or more special envoys, and if they're all supposed to report to the Secretary of State, you realize you've, in addition to all the regular structures, you really have a, a, an unworkable structure. Well, I, I used to count the Secretary probably 80 direct reports. Yeah. So, it, it, uh, it's not bad to, to put these under, some of them under a, a, a structured bureau and, and therefore have an undersecretary who's handling more of that. And I, I, I think we have to be very careful about the proliferation into areas that, again, sometimes become more symbolic. Uh, uh, and I think it deserves uh, more attention. On the conflict with other policies, this is very important. We tried to deal with a little bit uh, Richard Haas's experience working on Cyprus in relationship to our relationship with Turkey and NATO, uh, and we touch on that in the, in the, in the report. Uh, I experienced it in, in needing the cooperation of Ethiopia, absolutely critical to our policy, mm -hmm. but we had other issues with Ethiopia over democracy and human rights, and balancing that with the rest of the the, the U.S. government, and those are legitimate concerns. These aren't illegitimate when you're running up against it, uh, was a challenge, and we had to work it out and find out where the balance should be. But those, those uh, happen all the time, and that's where you need a policy uh, uh, process that, that will get at those, address it, and come to an agreement. I'll just give you one quick example, sorry. We needed a tough police uh, peacekeeping operation in the area of Abia. The UN had failed there, and the only ones we could go to were Ethiopia. Now, you know, for people who had all these other issues with Ethiopia, my God, they're going to give them one more thing that we are dependent on them. But we worked it through. We, we looked at it. The secretary and everybody was involved and said, look, the balance is right. We need them. So you have to go through a process and assess it. I'll just, I'll just say something briefly about the Matic envoys. I think it's a great point, and I was left thinking about whether I should talk about the Matic envoys or not. I decided not to because of the focus of the paper. But I think it's a, it, it's a challenge. If you look at the 25 envoys alone who are on the AFSA page, you know, they're for all kinds of different things. Um, we were very much, uh, I come to this issue in the context of the human rights issues where the, uh, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, which some would challenge shouldn't exist in any case and should be, there should be part of the, the, the thematic piece of every regional bureau, but they themselves were very upset about the, uh, the fragmentation of the various human rights issue, and for example, the Office of Religious Freedom or the Trafficking Office, which is something that I know most about. Um, and I think that it's 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 difficult because you know the the um, you know Mike Posner used to complain to me that you know he would come to uh, to New Delhi and the first thing that the ambassador would complain about was that 
damn trafficking office and why were they creating such problems and he was it was unable to talk about his agenda at the same time if the trafficking office didn't exist i wonder where the human trafficking modern slavery issue would be hmm. on his talking points with the ambassador like never mentioned so you know i think that this is the kind of challenge that has to be worked through and thought about and and i think that it's it's it, 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 it's tough and uh, you know you probably have to look on it on a case by case basis to try to figure out what's the right right answer and i agree with you that we should broaden this conversation to try to figure out when it makes sense and when it doesn't. So a couple of quick comments, and I appear to be losing my voice somehow in the middle of this panel. I'm just so moved uh, by the wisdom. Um, one, I, I think to, to pick up this theme of case studies, we actually thought about doing the QDDR on a case study model. Um, it's really much more effective and useful, I think, from the outside than from the inside. Uh, there is a tendency for every after action report to say nothing went wrong, everything was perfect, nothing to see here. Um, and these are really only useful if we're going to be honest uh, and really even getting willing to talk about individuals because uh, I think there can be a tendency to not want to criticize um, uh, folks. And we, if we're going to learn from this, and, and this is something we're looking at with QDDR, how do we become more of a learning institution at state? Um, where you are more capable of taking some risks if you understand that if things don't go right, it's an opportunity to learn and be better the next time. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, of course, the essence of what we preach in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation in the private sector. Right. It's not about succeeding 100% of the time. It's about taking risks and having them pay off over time. And we know all the reasons in terms of, we don't know all the reasons, but we know many of the reasons in terms of internal bureaucracy, in terms of how the Hill uh, reacts with, and, and the media often with gotcha Promotion. kind of things. Um, if you're basically trying to manage against failure instead of manage for success, it's an, it, it is a, a deadening environment. And we know we still attract the best and the brightest uh, into this, uh, into these institutions, um, but how do we do that? And I think that, that being able to get more comfortable inside and out with case studies and, and being able to say, yes, this was the right thing to try. Um, uh, it did not work out, but here's why it was the right thing to try. Here's what we mm -hmm. learned from it. So we're really trying to look, uh, look at that. I want to echo um, on the, the policy issue. I mean, I, I, something I wrote some about when I was in the think tank world before I came in, so it's a matter of public record. You look at something like Syria emerging, um, for that first year and a half. And structurally speaking, you not only have a state NSC and all the other equities, you have something that's smack, smack dab between NEA and EUR. You have Jordan, Turkey, and uh, uh, Israel and Lebanon all having slightly different attitudes towards this. So, and I think there was not, uh, I think it's fair to say, clarity from the White House on what the policy was. So that question of was the problem a structural problem, uh, was you know, Rob Ford empowered to do it, et cetera, I think we can look at these case studies both where an envoy came in and where they, they didn't come in. On the Congress thing, um, for those who don't know, I am a, a former member of Congress, so let me uh, uh, um, speak both ill of my kind uh, and, and defend them a little bit. Um, I think uh, Congress um, is uh, bored. Um, they don't pass a lot of laws anymore, um, and when they do, it's That's usually sad. at midnight in December when they're trying to go home. Um, and so I think this makes the ability to play in some of these sandboxes uh, more appealing. Um, and so whether that's calling people up for oversight or issues or whether it's um, uh, you know, wanting to show that they're doing something on a particular um, a crisis around the world. In their defense, however, um, and I've made this clear with my colleagues at State, uh, State does not always do the best job of really engaging with the Hill uh, respectfully and substantively. I think that it can be sort of a, uh, I, you know, we're, we're trying to save the world here and you're going to call us up for the 37th hearing. Um, so we're going to give vague answers and um, try to get back to doing what we're doing. Well, when Congress acts in a way that they're essentially only showing up for their three minutes of questioning to be able to show they were tough on state and wait for you to possibly misstate something and then that becomes the headline, of course, you start, again, to manage against failure instead of for success. So I think that cycle um, is not great. There's also been a history over the years of feeling like, um, particularly on some of the issues of human rights and corruption, that state has sometimes erred on the side of a favorable bilateral relationship. Um, and from uh, the, the standpoint of the Hill, that um, there has been more and more 
uh, attempts to leverage in, whether it's DRL or envoys or other things, because the sense is this is getting short shrift, which of course then means that you are having po you're, you, you're having some policy coherence because a set of elected officials who write your budget have basically made a decision that you're not getting the balance right, yeah. and those who are actually running the policy from state believe that this is the right policy. So you know, we, use, we often think about the NSC state split or a functional regional split on this, um, but we do preach democracy around the world, and <laughs> members of Congress were uh, elected. Um, uh, granted, some of that is for the highest bidder and in totally manufactured, redistricted uh, mayhem, but nonetheless elected and uh, uh, there. And you see this come up in, in other contexts. I, I mean, one uh, issue that's certainly come up a lot in the QDDR for obvious reasons has been the issue of physical security. Um, and this is uh, relevant in this context because obviously we're talking about conflict areas uh, to some extent. This was an issue before Benghazi, before the Kenya Mall attack, but it certainly um, spiked up. You can see from humanitarian organizations that complex risk, even outside of the political dynamics, has gone up considerably in the last few years, number of countries in, uh, facing complex, uh, complex conflict, et cetera, um, and how we operate. And then you have, again, with the Hill relationship, if I uh, were still up there and the people were wise enough to not have that be the case, uh, people in my district, um, and I was being asked to vote to train and equip a group of people, I'd probably want to go meet them. Uh, I'd want to look them in the eye and say, are these people that I want to support? Um, I'm the one who has to cast that vote. I'm the one who has to effectively write that check. Um, and at the same time, if you're state, I understand why the last thing you want is a bunch of Yahoo Congress people coming down and playing around on the Syrian border. So I think in, in all of these things, uh, you, you know, there really is genuine understanding. There, there, there are good arguments on both sides. And I think uh, the attitude probably has not has been de -es uh, has been escalating, and, and and I think that is part of where the special rep phenomenon comes from. More reports, because the fact is, Congress only has a limited set of tools in its tool set. Is that we can name a special envoy, we can demand a report. Um, you know, to some extent, we can earmark funding, but that actually requires them to get a budget passed. So, you know, it, it, it this is uh, I think something where uh, again, I as uh, someone who. Um, did have to represent people, and people worked their tails off to pay their taxes, and those are the taxes that pay uh, for state operations and aid operations. Uh, you know, that's an, that's got to be an important part of the conversation. Yeah. QDDR, Quadri Quadrennial, Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. Diplomacy Diplomacy and Development Development Review. Review. Yes. yes. I, I, yes. To get that. I, I will say, Tom, just to push back a little bit, I do think that there is an opportunity for a special envoy. You know, I think one of the things that, you know, Princeton could talk about was he had good relations on the Hill, he had good relations in civil society, and you can make those places a force multiplier if you use them in the right way. And I think that a lot of times with an assistant <coughs> secretary, even a deputy assistant secretary, which we haven't talked about, deputy assistant mm -hmm. secretaries are effective special envoys. Some of these smaller cases might be good to talk about that at some point. But uh, you know, there are a lot of issues with an assistant secretary that a particular member has that they want to raise with them, that they want to talk about their own pet rock. And a special envoy can go up and talk to members of Congress and uh, they do travel, they can reinforce messages, and so there is utility that, that can be done, and I think you're right, that sometimes state doesn't always use that in the most effective way. No, and, and I will echo that. I, I, I find it surprising that more chiefs of mission don't see every special rep as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to bring someone in, you can get press coverage, you can get meetings with civil society, you can emphasize an issue. In a world where government to government, traditional diplomatic contact is less and less the whole equation um, and how things are play out in the media, how they play out in social media. You know, I do think there is an opportunity to use each one of these offices and say, hey, I'm, you know, and uh, the ambassador to Sri Lanka did a lot of this and saying, hey, you know, I, I see 12 assets there that I can bring in and use creatively to push a message that I'm proactively doing. Now, that's different than when you've actually decided on a message in your country and then someone wants to come in and uh, mess with that strategy. But you know, these, they, these can be, I think, uh, huge opportunities. So. I, I'd add one other point, uh, and it, it cuts to your, uh, your current work, and that is the, the State Department being decades behind in internal structural reform. Uh, as David said earlier in, in today's program, uh, the tendency has been always just to add on additional layers rather than take a hard look at the way the building is structured to do what we're supposed to do. So that if an ambassador feels that he or she is being bothered by 
the work that has been decided is important for policy, then it's a reflection both of the ambassador's failure but also of the building's failure. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a discussion about doing in the State Department what the military had done in the 80s, which is to empower regional assistant secretaries uh, to become kind of undersecretaries who would then be able to make policy choices on how conflict resolution, human rights, labor issues, trafficking all fit in and to be able to call on resources the way that our regional commanders do in the military. Um, and I think until we, we start to take a look at that, we're going to be confronted not only with problems in the department, but problems with special envoys, because they, in a sense, almost need to proliferate when you haven't made basic policy priority choices. And that may, that, I think the connection between policy priorities and structure has not been looked at sufficiently. Let me make one, you know, go ahead. Okay. Did you consider the sorry, did you consider the possibility that there are some conflicts in which uh, the United States is viewed by both of the belligerents as so biased in favor of one that it has insignificant influence with both? And that if our real interest is peace, we might refrain from diplomatic initiatives which are likely to prove futile and give quiet support to others that might have more chance of success. I'll let Dan talk about that in terms of the Middle East. The, to some extent, that, that, uh, that uh, existed in the Sudan <coughs> South Sudan situation since there was a great deal of sympathy in the United States, in the Congress, in the administration for South Sudan's uh, long wars and, and desire for independence and problems on the other side with uh, what had happened in Darfur, et cetera, in Sudan. And so it, it posed an issue, but on the other hand, it was not a conflict in which we could really step back entirely. We did uh, in that case in part because we didn't talk to the president of Sudan rely as the principal negotiating body, the Africa Union's panel for this purpose, headed by South Africa former President Thabo Mbeki. So we did, in that case, need to, in effect, use our diplomacy in support of that process. But we had spent, as I testified before Congress, at, uh, between 2005 and 2010, spent $10 billion on the Sudan, South Sudan conflict, and we had a big stake in it. We couldn't quite just walk away. On the Bosnia side, it was a different situation. Most of our diplomacy was aimed at other Europeans. Uh, we had a situation, we had a, created what was called the Office of the High Representative, for the first one of whom was Carl Bildt, uh, former foreign minister of Sweden. And our problem was not so much keeping the Bosnians in line as it was making sure we were more or less on the same page with the Europeans. And um, since that also involved Russia, um, that was at times very difficult. In the office of the high representative, people still called him the UN high representative. He was not the UN high representative because um, EUR and the, gov the US government in general had a healthy distrust of uh, UN peacekeeping operations in the past. So it was intentionally kept separate from the United Nations and still is. I would add, uh, usually when people ask the question, they are thinking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. So I'm not trying to read your mind, <laughs> but I think it's probably a fair uh, reading of the question. Uh, and, and my own view has always been that um, the United States should get involved in this conflict resolution process to the extent that both sides want us involved. Uh, and the reality has been, even though we have a special relationship with the State of Israel that we do not have with the Palestine Liberation Organization. The reality has always been that both sides have wanted us to be at least involved, if not actually the primary third party. Now that may be changing, and I think uh, today we're now uh, coping with uh, dealing with a Palestinian move to the United Nations. I think it's healthy for this issue to take, be taken up in multilateral fora. Uh, but when it comes down to actual negotiating between Israelis and Palestinians, the go-to party has been the United States. My complaint, substantively on the issue, uh, 
has been that as much as we talk about being serious as a third party mediator, we really haven't been. And we have a policy problem where um, we haven't imbued the Secretary of State or the envoy with enough uh, authority and power to actually go out and do what a United States national interest would dictate uh, our envoy trying to do. I want to give the authors the last word here, but I, I will say one thing in teeing that up, which is, you know, I think that one of the things that I am hopeful about with special envoys um, and with the State Department in general um, is getting people, and this is going to sound a little cheesy, getting people excited about peace building. We are a war-weary country. You see that on the right and the left. I think the, we, the isolationist fever isn't as bad as it was a year ago. But people, um, I think it is an important moment for us to talk about diplomacy and development as part of the answer to the question, well, is there just going to be another ISIS five years and from now or ten years from now? Diplomacy and development is part of the answer to that in the context of individual conflicts and, and otherwise. In some cases that can be the deputy secretary, it can be a DAS, it, but this is something where I actually uh, want to capture the imagination of the American people a little bit. Um, to believe in this. And I think there has been a tendency of uh, at state and aid, probably less so in aid uh, in the last few years, that if your name is in the paper, that's somehow wrong, um, that you're not supposed to bring attention to yourself, et cetera. But we live in a world that actually can be in part about personality. I mean, Holbrook wrote a book to end a war. People like me read it, and it had a huge impact on our lives, yeah. right? Um, and that's not because he was a perfect man uh, and everyone got along with him perfectly. It was about a, an aspiration uh, in this way. And I think you know, one of the things we're looking at in the broader context that I think this can be a piece of is getting people excited about diplomacy. I've joked with the secretary that the state should have a Hollywood liaison, uh, <laughs> that all of my nieces and nephews know exactly what, or think they know exactly what a soldier and a spy is. They do not know what a diplomat is. Um, now, there have been some TV shows in the last year and some other things that have started to play that out. But I think, you know, we, we want to look at case studies not just to learn from them, but we also want to celebrate. Um, I mean, it's been the most enjoyable part of my job has been to go around and see amazing work that nobody ever hears about that our folks are doing every day in countries to try to build peace, to try to pull people out of poverty. And so, you know, for me, I, I think this is part of getting better, and we got to get better, we got to be honest when things aren't working, but we also want to tell the story about um, the fact that, uh, to the American people, that one of the things they support is this kind of uh, effort. Um, with that, I'll hand it to you all with, with our thanks for the report. You want to make? Yes. Uh, just very quickly, I couldn't agree more, and, and peacemaking and, pe and conflict resolution is tough work. I mean, uh, people wouldn't have gone to war if, it was, if, it, if there weren't some very difficult issues at stake. And while I think the use of special envoys or senior members of the department so empowered is important, it really takes a lot of people involved to get this done. That's why the, the using the full instruments of the department, if an envoy doesn't do that, it's a mistake. But beyond that, the point about multilateral institutions and other allies, absolutely critical. And, and you have to be engaged and engaged heavily. And sometimes it takes a very long time. But I, I, I couldn't agree more that this is an area that the U.S. can invest a great deal more in and I think will, will serve us very well in the future. I'd uh, make about six points. The first is don't take the job if you don't know the issues. The second is know the local players. You have to reach out to them. In Sarajevo, that meant not only the politicians, in fact, it meant politicians not very much, but to know the Grand Mufti, to know the Cardinal, to know the head of the Jewish community. These were the people who were really making policy in cultural terms, and cultural terms are key. Third, and this has been said in one way or another, know the dynamics in Washington. If you haven't got that game down, it's not going to work. Know the interests of other players. I mentioned the Europeans, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, NATO. All of these elements have to be factored into the mix if you're going to do your job. 
know the limits of the possible. In the early stages in Bosnia, not much was possible except preventing starvation and preventing any more mass executions. And finally, take the long view. Ask yourself, how would I like this place to look in 10 years? And how can we get there? When I was in the army, we had a sergeant who said, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. It's also true for special envoys. Thank you all very much. Thanks to USIP, um, and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you.